Thank you. <laughs> no, no rude sounds, please. We have an overflow crowd today. You must know that our guest is the head of New York City Transportation Authority. <laughs> hmm? Well, who'd you think it was? <laughs> if, if you wanted to compile a list of the uh, uh, famous men who had the traits of charm, I guess sophistication and style and what else, elegance, élan, uh, savoir-faire, all those things, um, I doubt if you could come up with more than a handful who have all of them, um, excluding oneself, of course. Um, <laughs> Cary Grant, certainly, uh, Fred Astaire, um, the Ed McMahon, uh, you know, there are, the list goes on and on. But, uh, but one man, <laughs> I'll be the judge of that. One man who, who really does embody all his traits and would probably be on everybody's list is my guest this evening, uh, Mr. David Niven. Now his career as an actor has spanned more than 40 years, four decades sounds more impressive, and has included an incredible list of movies. Around the World in 80 Days always comes to mind, Separate Tables, for which he won an Oscar, uh, Guns of Navarone, uh, Pink Panther, Casino Royale, Murder by Death, Death on the Nile. Uh, he's a graduate of Sandhurst Military Academy in England, I know that's important to you, and before becoming an actor, he really did intend to make a military career. And he was one of the first actors to volunteer for service in World War II, where he rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in the British Army. Uh, on his way to stardom, he was a lot of things, a lumberman, a wine merchant, and probably the most interesting of all, Errol Flynn's roommate. Uh, <laughs> he has written two autobiographical volumes entitled The Moon's a Balloon, was one, and Bring on the Empty Horses, which were bestsellers. And he's just published his first novel. There's no stopping this man. Uh, Go slowly, come back quickly is the intriguing title. If you will welcome then, please, the incomparable David Niven. I suppose because I, I went on rather long there about, uh, about your, your reputation for style and elegance and so forth, and that uh, most people, if you had to guess, would f assume that you were born an aristocrat of some sort uh, to a, an elegant family in a country home with the chauffeured roles and all the things that go along with that. Is that almost true? Well, the start was rather like that. It, it, was, it was meant to be. Hmm. But my father was killed in the first war when I was four, and it turned out he was broke. And so we had no money at all, and, and my mother had four children and not a penny. How does that happen, that somebody seems to have money and then is suddenly discovered to be broke? Uh, just the genius at, at, at faking it? At, uh, no, he what? spent hugely, he gambled. Yeah. He gambled on horses a lot and all sorts of other things, and he, he blew it. Yeah. And uh, we were in a nice spot. Yeah. Uh, I also didn't know, or if I did know, I'd forgotten, that you had a rare kind of tuberculosis as a child. I got That's it something. apparently from drinking milk at the London Zoo, which was not to pasteurize in those days, and I got, mm -hmm. I got it in the jugular vein. And they, they nipped out, for, uh, I'll show you. Lovely scar from there. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Can we get a nice tight close-up on that scar? Well, see? <laughs> they took out uh, four and a half inches of it. And they put uh, a silver tube in. Silver tube. But this is, uh, this is uh, 150 years ago. And, <laughs> and they, they had they none, silver of, then? <laughs> no, none of that nice jab and out. It was uh, yeah. suffocation with chloroform and ether and gas, you know. It was mm -hmm. quite awful. I had eight operations. They, <coughs> they put in a tube, which was a smaller in diameter than the vein. Mm -hmm. So the blood had uh, swelled up the other little veins a bit. Then they nipped that out, put another one in, nipped that out and did eight times until they tied up the end ones. I had my throat cut here without any trouble at all. <laughs> Good to know that, isn't it? I got a raspy voice, forgive me, I've been traveling. Ah, oh, yes, well, uh, yeah, you really have. Um, uh, you've forgiven everything. Uh, were you what they call a, a good student, an obedient chap in school? I said, he, he said, wide-eyed, knowing that the truth was somewhere. No, I, I was a beast. <laughs> a beast? A beast. <laughs> I, I, awful thing happened to, I, um, I was in the choir. Mm -hmm. 
and I sang beautifully that high treble. Yeah. And I was doing a solo on Pum Pumpkin Sunday, whatever it's called. <laughs> and and the, the Bishop of Ripon was there, I remember that. He was the star guest, and all the parents. And I was piping my way through, there's a green hill far away, and a terrible thing happened, a medical change set in. Right then? Right there and then. I brayed like a dog. Brayed like a donkey. <laughs> oh, it's a terrible noise. And the mm. choir fell apart, of course, the best of them. And I was caned. The, the, the headmaster was sure I'd done it on purpose. I didn't. The evidence was there from then on. You know, whenever. You don't have scars to prove that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> For an additional 50 cents, you can see the scars. <laughs> <laughs> but whenever I've heard of caning, as a kid, I always thought, how terrifying, because my image of a cane was a hard stick of wood, which was what my grandfather carried as a cane. Um, but they were, they were sort of flexible, which probably makes them even more painful. What, what actually do they cane you with? Is it? Well, it was usually fruit wood, I believe. Fruit wood. Except yeah. it didn't break. <clears throat> and it was very painful. They caned you for absolutely nothing. Yeah. I mean, that was quite a big offense, to have a medical change like that. But but it was awful, and, and um, I went to two prep schools. I was sent away when I was six, six years old, to boarding school, which is cruelty to animals, I think. Mm -hmm. And there, it was a vile school, at the end of the First war, for World War I, and the masters were all sort of sadistic, uh, what they were. And I remember being hung out of a window, fourth, fourth floor, the window being shut in my back, my legs being held by two terrified children and being caned for um, getting the wrong declension in Latin. And uh, that's a stupefying height for a small yeah. boy, too. And it was, it, it was a ghastly. Has anybody ever explained what attracted so many sadists to the British school system? <laughs> um, well, it looked like it. Yeah, you're it's, right. It, it, it must have been. You always hear stories of these mm. Dickensian figures who. Uh, who cane, who beat, who punish in obscene ways. Uh, I don't know what it is. But they were clever. I got expelled in the end. <clears throat> uh, I went from that school, which was awful, to a school that was very nice. Yeah. And uh, I left the first school because I got blood poisoning. <clears throat> I had a boil on my leg, and the matron, so-called, nipped off the top of it with a pair of scissors. So I got terrible blood poisoning. <clears throat> I had to go to the hospital. And then, finally, my mother caught on. I was removed. I went to a very nice school with the lovely matron and nice masters and everything. It all went to my head. <laughs> and I got fired. You did? Yeah, I got expelled. Uh, I did a, a naughty, dirty thing. Well, I wouldn't want to know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want to know? Yeah, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> it was very well disgusting. I had a friend at, at another school, and um, he had uh, pneumonia. And in those days, you nearly always died, or often did, because it got to a crisis and the parents were sent for, and that was it. Now it's much easier, I think. But he was at his crisis. I didn't know this. I thought he had flu. So I sent him a present. This is a terrible story. Make it expelled again. Good. I sent him a present. I must remind you that there is a cane backstage. <laughs> I sent him a present, a very old trick of a huge box with a smaller one inside, then another one and a smaller one, and finally a matchbox. And in the matchbox, I'm ashamed to say, I put a, a piece of dog's mess. <laughs> not a funny, not a funny joke, uh -huh. particularly for the matron who opened it. <laughs> and he was dying, and, and this thing arrived. And for, he said it flew out into a cabinet, had to be removed with forceps and. And he said that from that moment on, he got better. <laughs> and he, he, and I saw him the other day, he was a full colonel in, in the SAS. He got two DSOs in the war. Very brave man. Gee. Well, that's mildly witty, I suppose. I mean, it isn't, it isn't something you'd expect Noel Coward to do, but it's... Uh, <laughs>